So I've been having trouble figuring out exactly how I want to make this video and talk about this movie series. I didn't know if I wanted to explain it and spoil it all, convince you to watch it, add it to a larger concept for a different video. But then I realized with my last channel and with this one, all I've been doing is just trying to share the experience I had with something and hope that you have the same experience or already had a similar experience when you watched it before. So a little over a week ago, I was hungover on a rainy Sunday and had nothing to do but find a good movie to watch. And I proceeded to watch all three surprisingly terrifying movies of an indie mockumentary series Hell House LLC. Man, there's something about a rainy scene in a car that always gets me. Created by independent filmmaker Steven Cognetti, I'm, I think that's how you pronounce it, the original Hell House gained underground success before officially releasing to the public in 2016, winning underground film festival awards and having the perfect formula for a cult following. It still surprises me that this movie wasn't more popular, getting a great audience and even critic reviews, originally receiving an 89% on Rotten Tomatoes, but it now has decreased to 75 over the past like seven and a half, eight years. And I need to preface this recommendation and video with this is a low budget film series. Most of the time it doesn't matter or affect it because that is the style. And you know, art is art and all that. But for people who aren't as big of fans of independent low budget films, you have to look past a few things, especially the second and third one in order to fully enjoy this. So I actually watched this movie on accident. I saw a TikTok video about this movie with a scene that was genuinely horrifying. And I thought this creator was talking about a similar but very different movie, The House's October Bill. And underrated found footage horror film about a group of friends trying to find the scariest haunted house that I had watched like probably when it came out 10 years ago. So I searched up Hell House LLC with the thought that I was going to be watching this other movie that I'd already seen, something that always brings me comfort. And all three movies are free with ads on Tubi. No, this is not a paid promo thing. I wish it was, but it was just extremely convenient and I quickly realized this was not the movie I thought it was. But it was in the found footage style, so I was in. I don't care what anybody says, but I love found footage films. I was thinking about making a video about some of my favorites, so let me know in the comments if that's something you want to see. But anyway, let's get back to the video. The first installment follows a fake haunted house crew of five friends through a documentary about the tragic events five years after they happened. We got Alex, the owner of the Hell House business and attraction, his girlfriend Sarah, his childhood best friend Mac, and the first two people Alex and Mac hired to the team, Tony and Paul. We will meet the creators of this documentary later, but this is where the mockumentary multiverse starts. We are introduced to the story by these fantastically acted interviews with an author and investigative journalist who researched the Hell House incident, but I point out their acting because they really play their parts perfectly and make this feel real. But all we know is that a group of friends who had ran the Hell House haunted attraction in New York City moved the haunted house to a small town in Rockland, New York called Abaddon. I don't know why this is so hard to say, an Abaddon in an abandoned hotel. That's like three words that sound the same. On the opening night of their attraction, 19 people died including four of their friends and the police said it was due to a malfunction and answered little to no questions to anyone since the event. The only piece of footage or information anyone has is a video uploaded by one of the tour goers where you can see them go through the house with routine scares until they reach the basement and a crowd of terrified customers are rushing back up the stairs to get out. For years, the mystery of what happened at the Abaddon Hotel that night in 2009 was left to speculation and conspiracy theories until Diane Graves and Mitchell Cavanaugh started making the documentary that we are watching now. While doing research, the last remaining survivor of the Hell House crew, Sarah, who hasn't been heard from since the incident, reached out to Diane to do an interview about what happened. She clearly looks traumatized, not giving them much to work with until she pulls out a bag of videotapes. The entire process from setting up the attraction to the night of the tragedy was filmed by the Hell House crew, and that's what we watched for the majority of the film, with some occasional cuts to some interviews. I won't give a full recap of the events because I do want you guys to watch it, but I'm about to spoil a lot of it, so I'm sure I'll have time codes throughout the video of when the spoilers are gonna happen. From the get-go, I was fully convinced of these characters. I gotta give credit to these actors. I mean, this shit really does feel real. It, of course, it has that little extra cheesy undertone, but it is a horror movie after all. The hotel's dark abandoned aesthetic gives them the perfect start and everything is going smoothly, but the signs are already there. I mean, there's a damn pentagram in the basement. That, that is enough for me. And I don't even really believe in ghosts, but that's a conversation for a different day. We also see that the leader Alex is a bit off, completely convinced that this will work and he ignores any warning at all cost. We get a few subtle creepy things to warm us up, but the second we meet this clown, shit starts to go south real fast. I don't know where they got this mask if they made it for the movie, but this clown is absolutely terrifying. One of the scary scariest horror movie monster villains I've ever seen. Like, it, it's just the eyes and his presence. I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, why does he look so sad, bro? What have you seen? What have you done? 
I want to save those scares for you though so I won't spoil what he does but we also see that Sarah, Alex's girlfriend, seems to have some sort of weird connection with the hotel. Getting caught staring blankly at religious statues and sleepwalking and talking to a wall in the basement in the middle of the night. Alex doesn't want them talking about anything that's going on and plays it off as pranks once the actors start coming in a few weeks before opening. This Alex guy is just greasy man but one of the actors, the girl that they're going to have chained up in the basement, says that allegedly the owner of this hotel in the 1980s, Andrew Tolley, was a leader of a satanic cult in hung himself in the dining room. Apparently a lot of his guests kept going missing and his business started failing which led him to do what he did, but that's just what the police of the town have been saying. Speaking of the town, Abaddon, this happens to be the name of a demon that guards the gateway to hell in some ancient biblical text. There's just a lot more to this hotel in town than just the hell house incident and Alex definitely knew about this before they went to the hotel. They power through to two days before the opening night somehow, but Paul seems to have left without a trace and they think he's just being a piece of shit, but like, D bro, give him a chance. They didn't even call his ass. They find him later that night in the basement in complete shock after some more genuinely scary demonic encounters, but the show must go on. We finally get to opening night in October of 2009, and we finally see what really happened. And it's just so cool to see it match up with the original YouTube footage from the beginning. Everything just ties in beautifully. But we also see how the crew members were really killed and how it was impossible for Sarah to make it out of there alive. Again, I don't want to spoil too much, but let's just say hell was unleashed in that hotel. We cut back to current time as Diane and Mitchell are wrapping up their interview with Sarah, but before she leaves, she creepily tells them to go check out the hotel for themselves, and that if they need to find her, she will be in room 2C. Diane and their other co-worker leaves while Mitchell stays back and is the first person ever to watch these tapes. She can't find Sarah anywhere in the hotel they were just at, and when they finally head to the Abaddon Hotel and break in, Mitchell sees what we just watched for the entire film, and he tries to warn them, but they ignore his call and move forward. Upstairs, the rooms are obviously all numbered and they find room 2C and inside is a possessed Sarah and we end the first film with the death of Diane and her cameraman, um, I don't know his name, it's not really important. After enjoying the first one so much and knowing they had about two years and some change in between, I was hoping for something almost just as good and the second one is still good but there's definitely a big budget decrease in some areas but it's, it still does feel real most of the time. So the first movie was a documentary about the found footage of the Hell House incident in 2009. And in this cinematic universe, Hell House 1 was a movie made by Mitchell after Diane died. And then the second one, the one we're talking about now, is back and forth footage of a TV show called Morning Mysteries and a private investigator show called The Inside. There's some good scares here and there. And again, I did at least enjoy the second one, but this focused more solely on story building rather than what made the first one such a big hit, making you scared and uneasy, you know, being a good horror movie. So on the Morning Mysteries portion of the show, we start out with a mom being interviewed about her missing son Jackson. After the release of the first documentary, people started breaking into the Abaddon Hotel to try and find proof of ghosts or evidence of what happened. And of course, Jackson did the same and hasn't been seen since, but he's been texting his mom, or somebody has, very alarming messages and emails and very horrifying videos. I didn't mention this earlier, but there's a melody played on the piano that is played throughout the first film. If you do watch it, it's the one that, um, what's his name? Tony? No. Yeah, Paul plays with the uh, mannequin. And in one of the videos Jackson sent to his mom, you can clearly hear the same melody and she recognizes this from Jackson's childhood. So one night back in the late 90s, he went to the family keyboard and played the same melody. And as all the lights shut off, he stops and says, the hotel opens in 2009, tell everyone. A little cheesy, but it, it is important. Back to Morning Mysteries, we got this old dude who's a part of Abaddon's town government, Mitchell who made the Hell House documentary, and then a TV psychic. And they are here to discuss if what is shown in the first movie was real or not. Mitchell claims that the film was a warning and that Sarah, whether she is dead or alive, used Diane to bring more people to the hotel to what we can assume is to be sacrificed. And then after the interview, this girl Jess, the host of the other show, The Inside, reaches out to Mitchell for her own investigation of the hotel. They've actually gotten further than anyone else has and figured out that the owner of the hotel, Andrew Tolley, and his cult members did a group self-sacrifice, that, that's what I'm calling it for YouTube purposes, in the dining room, and they filmed everything they did at the hotel. They believe that the tapes and the evidence are in the basement, and if they can get it to the public, this could show that the town government and law enforcement has been covering up what's going on here, and they can get the hotel demolished for good. Oh yeah, another thing to mention is the town keeps avoiding demolishing it, but I forgot to mention that earlier. We then watch from their handheld cameras, Mitchell, Jess, and her crew, and then of course the TV psychic as they go through the hotel. Again, not as many good scares as the first one, but I, I won't spoil it for you. I do still think it's worth the watch. While they're about to leave with all the tapes, the torment starts, and this leads to Mitchell, Jess, and the other girl being the only ones left, tied up by demons in the dining room. The old dude from the interview pops out and turns out he's actually Andrew Tolley. 
He has opened a gateway to hell in the basement, and him and his cult have gained immortality as long as they continue to sacrifice people to what he refers as the lake of fire. Each time a group of people are drawn to the hotel through some demonic means, again like the piano melody or Sarah, they are all sacrificed and then one is left behind to draw in more people. We can assume this has been going on since the 80s, but Sarah is the first one that we saw, and then Jess is the one left at the end of the second movie. And then some of the tapes that they found before they were killed were of Alex and the Hell House crew. And we find out that Alex was lured in by Andrew Tully months prior to opening Hell House, and didn't tell anyone that he was completely out of money and Tully offered the hotel for free. Man, I knew that guy was greasy. So even though the second one had some lackluster moments, for being an independent low-budget film series, I was really impressed with what Steven was able to accomplish with the first two films. And the third one was actually the one I was recommended on TikTok, but when I saw that it came out only a year after the second one, I started to get worried. But how can they close out this underground hit? Well, um, the third one sucks. There are some good scares, so there, there, there's a couple of them, I won't even lie, there's a couple good scares, but they wrap up the story start to finish completely, answering most of the questions, which I guess I'm happy with, but dude, I, I really don't even want to talk about it. Like the main thing that made me so mad was this guy's face scar. Like it looks so fake and they could have easily written it out. It was literally only mentioned once. Why the f does it look like that? But yeah, if you enjoyed the first two as much as I did, the third one, I guess is worth the watch because it is only like an hour and 22 minutes and it does wrap up the whole story. But yeah, I just, it's not even worth talking about, bro. Like I don't want to shit on it because I really do like the first two. And a lot of people say with trilogies and sequels and stuff sometimes just the first movie is good enough you don't need to make movies after it i liked the story building they did with the second one you know like it was enjoyable but i would have rather just had those questions being left unanswered than have seen this third movie like it, it really left a bad taste in my mouth about this series to where i almost didn't make the video but the first one is just so good so if anything watch the third one if you like the first two obviously but just have a good laugh watching some horror schlock so the reason I made this video is because I truly believe this is a very fun experience start to finish. It would be great to watch with friends, your significant other, even alone, and it's especially fun to watch when you're super high. But I feel like it's good to point out lesser known films because you can tell everyone, especially the actors in this first film, put a lot into this trilogy. Like as much as the third one sucks, like. I'm gonna have to give it to Steven Cognetti, like, the first one is that much of a good movie. Running in at a little under four hours in total, the Hell House LLC trilogy is deserving of a watch and its underground praise. But the biggest takeaway I had was after I watched the first three movies, like, for the whole next two weeks after, anytime I was turning off the lights, walking in my room, closing a door, I was on edge, bro. I was looking in the corner thinking that that clown was gonna be in my basement or gonna be in the corner of my room or some shit. Like, for real, bro, this clown is f terrifying. Let me know what you guys thought about this video and Hell House in the comments below. I want to do a fun video that switched up the cycle of usual content we have on here, but I'll be back with some more full-on series and movie explanations soon where I usually spoil the whole thing. But I'm telling you, man, I, I swear this isn't a paid promo from Tubi, but I, I really wish. There were only a couple ad segments through the whole movies, and they actually got some good shit on there. Like, I know just these movies are on there and it's completely free, but I think there's this other movie with um, Jake Gyllenhaal and what's his name? Tobey Maguire, the guy who played Spider-Man. Like there's, there's some good shit on there and it's all completely free. You don't even need to sign up. All I'm saying is Tubi, I'm, I'm doing you a favor. If you wanna do some paid promo, if you wanna do some ad stuff with me, I'm always open. But for real, if you trust my opinion, just go on there and watch the first one, the Hell, the Hell House LLC one. It's only like an hour and a half. It, it is a very, very fun experience. Thanks for all the support last year. My main goal for 2023 is to keep making better and better videos. So I'm always open to your guys' suggestions. Make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on that notification button and I'll see y'all soon.